If I gave you two minutes to write everything you believe on this card, could you do it? Or would you run out of space or out of time? Would you have to get your Bible? Or could you do it off the top of your head? And how would you make sure you didn't leave anything out? Then what if I took this card and gave it to a total stranger? How would they react to what you wrote? Would they be able to understand what you believe so that if it struck them as true, they could believe the same thing? Would they be able to share your beliefs with others? See, most of us know what we believe in a general sense, but putting those beliefs into words, especially in a few words that anyone can understand, is no small task. That is, unless you have a creed. In chapter two, we get our first real look at the creed itself. If you're not familiar with the Nicene Creed, it's printed in the chapter and again at the end of the book. You can also read it on powerofthecreed.com. The simplest way to think of the creed is the whole Christian faith on a note card. The Nicene Creed takes everything that it means to be a Christian and condenses it into four short but powerful paragraphs on God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and life in the church. All the backstory on the creed, who wrote it, when and why, is in the chapter. What I'd like to do now is look at the opening line by Augustine. I'm gonna read a little more than is in the chapter, just for context, because a little extra Augustine never hurt anyone. Receive the rule of the faith, which is called the creed. And when you have received it, write it on your heart and say it daily to yourself. These words which you hear in the creed are in the divine scriptures scattered up and down. But here they are gathered together and reduced into one that every person may be able to say, able to hold what he believes. Augustine has a lot of amazing one-liners, but that every person may be able to say and to hold what he believes has to be my favorite. It's the best explanation I've found for why we have and need a creed. Of course, there are those who say we don't need a creed. Maybe you've heard the mantra, no creed but the Bible before. The people who say things like this mean well they don't want anything to take precedence over the word of God. But is that what creeds do? Replace the Bible with tradition? Not according to Augustine. These words which you hear in the creed are in the divine scriptures scattered up and down, but here they are gathered and reduced into one. I love the scriptures. I try to read them as often as I can, sometimes even in the original language but nothing has helped me understand the Bible better than the Nicene Creed. It takes hundreds, maybe even thousands of verses from the law and the prophets and the gospels and weaves them together so clearly and simply that honestly, the first time I read the Creed, I was embarrassed by how much I had missed. The Creed helped me see all of scripture in context not just my favorite parts. It gave me the language to say with confidence, not just what I believe, but what Christians have always believed. But the creed does more than give us the right words to say. It also helps us hold on to what we believe. This other dimension of the creed is really what the book is about. And it always makes me think of a story from the best and only Byzantine novel I've ever read. The plot, like most things from Byzantium, is a little melodramatic. A Turkish prince meets a girl from Constantinople and converts to Christianity. They get married, start a family, and live happily ever after. 
until one day the prince realizes he hasn't seen his brothers in a while and returns home for a visit. But instead of a family reunion, he's greeted by a sword. His brothers want to kill him. And it's understandable. He abandoned the family and the faith. It's a fairly typical medieval drama up to this point. But when the prince's brothers ask him for any last words, he responds with a beautifully personalized version of the Nicene Creed. It brought the brothers to tears, and it did the same for me the first time I read it. Now, I know it's a story, but that story rang true in the day it was written. For so many Christians throughout history, the Nicene Creed was more than something they said in church. It went with them everywhere. It wasn't just how they talked about the faith, it was how they lived the faith. It wasn't just how they became Christians, it was how they remained Christians to the end. Can you do all these things without a creed? Sure, but why would you want to? These are the words that fire has tried, that generations have tested, that have transformed the lives of millions. I want to encourage you not to be afraid to learn from those who went before us. In the remaining chapters, I try as hard as possible to get out of the way and let the creed and those who wrote it speak for themselves. You may not agree with every voice from the Christian past. That's okay. But if you listen, you will find far more in common than you ever could disagree with but you'll also find that rare thing in the modern world, a faith to hold on to.